it's show 100 of Rich Herring's Leicester Square Theatre Podcast. Thank you so much for watching and or listening and or both. Uh, so uh, this is, we've got Richard Bacon on, which should be very, very exciting. Uh, he's an interesting man who has had to apologise for a lot of things in his life, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but if you've enjoyed these podcasts, like we've done 100 podcasts, if you've never given us anything for these in return for these, do you think maybe they're worth one pence each? And could you go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges and give us a pound? If everyone gave us a pound a month, uh, we would be able to make uh, sitcoms, maybe films. We'd be able to put on, we could make a big film studio and put on all sorts of things, but we could certainly pay for all the episodes of this. And uh, we're going to try and do as it occurs to me as well with that money. So uh, if you like this stuff and want us to do more, go and make a small donation. There's lots of you out there. And if you all just make a tiny donation, that would really help. Uh, but like it's 100 episodes long. Just think about that. That's incredible. What a waste of time. Anyway, here we go with Rich Chang's Less Square Theatre Podcast and Richard Dickey Bacon. thought about what I'm going to say and I realised how wrong it is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who has had two eight-year-old girls at the penis level of his penis. <laughs> naked penis. It was alright though. It was what it was. <laughs> it's Richard Herring. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Hello Leicester. You're, you're much better than last week's audience. They were great. They were all pricks last week. <laughs> Every last man jack of them. Uh, welcome to Richard Aaron's Letter Square Theatre Podcast. Or as some of the cooler kids have started, there are some of them that have started, because they get a lot of eight year old girls who hang around <laughs> at eye level of people. They've started calling it Rahul Lustafa. <laughs> through the trauma of uh, doing that. This is the 100th episode. <laughs> If you ignore the specials, it's the hundredth episode done here in the Leicester Square Theatre, which is an incredible thing, I think. And boy, oh boy, do have we saved the the best guests. We've had some names on this one, but boy, you won't believe who we've got. Uh, and uh, we've got the best audience. We've got the lady here who did, who did look at me when I told her not to look at me before. What's what's your name? Zoe. You got a Union Jack back. That's pretty uh, patriotic. What do you do for a living, Zoe? You work for a housing association, I've talked to you last week. So, uh, you look very different. If you come in disguise, did you disguise yourself so that I wouldn't recognise you? I just saw the bag, I thought, oh, I'm not talking. We had an embarrassing conversation last week. And let's not do that again. Uh, let's talk to this man here wearing a very nice shirt. Let's have, we're just, we're, we're going to just do the shirt. So, if we get your head off, this is like point of view pornography. We don't want to see your. <laughs> we don't want to see the man's face. It will ruin, ah, it's ruined it. So uh, what, do you, what do you do for uh, a living, sir? What's your name, I should ask you? Steph, right? You're Steph? Test software. You test software, have I talked to you before? No. No, okay. I just said that in a way that... And I should have known that you test software, because obviously... <laughs> as, as the friend, our friend from India, you're in back again from India? Is he back in India? No, he's gone back to India. Uh, that was last week. He tests software as well, so that's, it's nice that... Um, yeah, what, what's the best software you've tested this week? <laughs> Broadcast software, yeah, it's good. It's, that's good. No, that's my favourite. <laughs> <sighs> Boring, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you happy with your, the way your life's turned out? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. So, uh, Steph, there, he's happy with the way his life's turned out, uh, which is a good thing. It's a nice. Th oh, I can't say the same. It's, just, it's a. This is look at what I do for a living. Just create an awkward atmosphere. <laughs> Well, look, we're going to crack straight on. I've got an, I'm very excited to talk to this guest. He usually is living in LA. You know, imagine all the people from LA I could have got over for the hundred of episodes. I've been trying to get people from LA and, you know, over into the big film stars. But he lives in LA. He's probably best known uh, for his work on behind the scenes of Topless Darts on Ice <laughs> on live TV. <laughs> there were so many to choose from from him. It was... Uh, it was so many, you wouldn't believe it. Please welcome, it's Richard Bacon, ladies and gentlemen. It's Richard Bacon. Welcome. Sit down, grab a, grab a microphone. Hello. Richard Bacon. Hello. 
I think uh, Topless Dance on Ice, I still think, is my best work. <laughs> <laughs> and what it, what about you, behind the scenes of Topless Dance on Well, Ice? I was uh, filmed at the Bayswater Ice Rink, uh, Richard. I'm surprised you missed it. <laughs> I um, did miss it. And it was literally that. Li li does anyone remember live TV? It was <laughs> more than I was expecting. <laughs> if only that many people had bothered watching it. <laughs> Uh, it was a cable channel set up by the Daily Mirror. It was in Canary Wharf. Um, and it was my first job in London. Yeah. And they just had these big, bold, bold ideas without any real money. They tried to buy the premiership at one point, right? <laughs> they tried to buy it, but they didn't have the money to do it. <laughs> um, uh, they had Thomas Dots on Ice. Uh, and they also had, they had a soap opera. So it was, it was, the reason it was terrible, and it used to be called by Private Eye, Piss Poor Live TV. <laughs> and... The reason it was terrible is it had no focus. It tried to be BBC One, but it tried to do everything. So they said, right, we have to have a soap opera. But they didn't have extra studio space. So I would be writing my news bulletin, and they would be filming scenes for the soap opera around the news desk. And some, I remember writing a news bulletin, and next to me, two people were simulating sex at the end of the desk, <laughs> which was being filmed for... Uh, the sitcom which was called Canary Wharf. And you probably have forgotten how the sitcom <laughs> Canary Wharf on live TV ended. I haven't because I've read your book, but tell everyone well, else. Uh, <laughs> it ends with Canary Wharf Tower being lifted into space by some aliens. <laughs> <laughs> which could have happened. Which could have, I think I might have been on the first day of live TV. I think, I think I was interviewed on the very first day of live TV. It was before all this sort of stuff started happening. Richard E. Grant was there. Yeah. Me and Stuart Lee were there. I think, I imagine it was probably on day one quite exciting. It was very exciting on day one. Who knew what was going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> no one knew about News Bunny, which I didn't know was Ashley Hames, who I've played at poker. It was Ashley, Ashley Hames. Hames. Yeah. I got, uh, I took News Bunny down to, so I was a reporter, and at News Bunny, so Ashley, you sort of a work experience at the time, wears the outfit. And I took the News Bunny to the state opening of Parliament. And, um, <laughs> and I, we got dragged away by the parliamentary police. They have their own police force, Parliament. Yeah. And I got dragged away, and then I, ha I, uh, I got a letter from Black Rod, who runs both houses. And um, I've still got it framed, and it says that I'm banned for life from the House of Commons and the House of Lords. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> what if you're elected to become an MP? Would, uh, would he still... Can't happen, that? can it now? I know, I know many of you are really rooting for me to run for Prime Minister, but sadly, it now can't happen. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Terrible. So this is very odd. It's a, a big thing for us because this is the last day of your 30s today. Yeah, it is. So yeah. we're recording this. So last night uh, I had my 40th birthday party um, and um, I've had no sleep. Well, a bit of sleep. I got to bed at 7 a.m. this morning. And thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I think it's certainly worth cheering that. I, I, ne I never really know whether my life is quite glamorous or a mess. And yeah. so... I, I had my 40th birthday party at a street food event in East London. I took over a street food event, okay. which obviously at 40, you're too old to do. Um, and I, I left so late. I got out there. It was, I looked at my watch. It was 6.20 in the morning. And I thought, I'm and I was a mess. And I've got two kids. And I thought, if I go home now, they'll be getting up when I come in. And so I thought, I decided that I'd left too late to go home. So I just went and checked into the ground show. <laughs> and then there were no trains home this morning. So I've just been hanging around Leicester Square waiting for this podcast all day. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm, your life I'm is a mess. That is, your life is a mess. <laughs> it's sort of showbiz and then not show, and then you come here. Yeah. And and last day of your thirties. That's. I mean, it could be that could be true of any of my guests in the thirties if I murdered them during the podcast. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm not going to murder you during the podcast. Yeah, that'd be okay. <laughs> that would be a good hundredth episode, wouldn't it? Yeah. Be exciting. That get viewers. Yeah. yeah. Get, get viewers. Uh, are you are you worried about turning forty? Well, I thought I'd ask you about it. Um, uh, it's, I'm nearly through. I'm nearly fucking through. This. It was a while ago. It was. Well, I did a show called Oh Fucking Forty. It was a big. I was. I found it a big deal turning forty, and I was very upset about it. Um, but now I can't believe. You know, I really now I'm just thinking of myself as fifty now because I'm practic. I'm an only. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a year and a half away, but it just, I, I always do, I, I do that so I'm ready for the next birthday. 
I always just imagine I'm the next age up anyway, but this time I've done two just because I feel so I feel like I'm in my fifties. So why were you anxious about turning forty? Because you know I've li- I've made it li- like you, Richard. I've made a living from uh, being a youthful puerile idiot, <laughs> and, uh, and I wondered whether Thank that could continue. <laughs> That's my pleasure. I wondered if I could continue into my forties. As it turned out, I could. <laughs> so it was fine. Uh, but uh, I think it was you know I wasn't married. I didn't have a family, and I was you know I was. I was a little bit lost and wondering where my career was going, so I think there was all those kind of things in, in the mix as well. I, um, I, I'm not anxious about it. I, I, what I remember, I, very, I remember my dad turning 40, and I remember he had a party. I mean, we all, my whole family are chaotic and a mess, and um, we all kind of drink a lot. Um, and he had an out of control, I had quite an out of control party last night, he had one as well, and at, at our house in Mansfield in Nottinghamshire, and the police came and they shut it down, and we're all really proud. <laughs> Um, but I remember I was 13, and when you're 13 and your dad turns 40, you think, he looks really old. Yeah. And so I remember thinking, uh, when I was 13, he looked really old. And recently I thought to myself, well, he probably didn't look old, it's just the perspective of a 13-year-old. Mm. And then I found the family video of his 40, <laughs> and he looked really old. Yeah. <laughs> and I've taken some solace from the fact <laughs> that I don't look as old as my dad did when he turned 40. Uh, but I think, you know, but in the old days, like when I was young, if you someone who was 40 or 50, they were like probably... Yeah. Guys would be 40 and put slippers on in a cap and sit in the chair and waiting for death. You know, there was, it was like, <laughs> it was properly old. If once you were 50, it was like that was, you could viably just sit in the pub in your slippers. So, uh, I, I'm always surprised by my failure to kind of moderate my behaviour as I get older. Yeah. Like, I don't really change at all. Um, I remember uh, Emma Freud, who presents, um, what's that show on Radio 4? Loose Ends, she's on Presents Loose Ends. And she read the, that very trivial book that I wrote. And she said to me, her main observation was, she said, you just don't learn from your mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really smart observation. Well, I've read, I enjoyed your book. I've read your book. I read it very quickly. It's not that long. Uh, <laughs> and it cost £9.99 on Kindle. I think that's uh, over expense. But I, think I, I literally got it. Because, you know, they give you an advance, right, when you write <laughs> yeah. a book. And they, they give you the word count. I think I, I, think I, got, I was like three over. Like, I just basically wrote as, as few as I possibly could. It really doesn't read like that, Richard. It doesn't, it doesn't read when you're going, oh, uh, I mentioned him in chapter one, I can't remember if I gave his name or not. I'm not going to look back and find out. <laughs> that would take extra time. It's a very entertaining book, though, so it is very good. I can't remember where I was going with this now. Now I've been distracted from it, but... Uh, it well, no, I was simply going to say that I don't moderate my behaviour, that yeah. I, you know, so I... I even, even though I've had kids, I've got, like, you know, a two- and a four-year-old, and if most people, when they have kids, they change and they don't yeah. go out as much and they get in earlier and they... Oh, I, I, don't, I just haven't changed Well, any your life is a way. series of apologies, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's... <laughs> which is great. Yeah, that's so you don't learn. But then I think, like, a lot of the things uh, that have happened to you uh, don't seem to be... Well, from your book, at least, don't seem to be directly your fault. Well... I think, I think a lot of kind of things... There's been misunderstandings and... There have, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, some things have definitely been my fault. Yeah. I'm sure you can think of one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but even that isn't real. I mean, we're not going to talk about it at length. No, but I think what's, I well, I don't want to... Everyone knows that story. You know, you know what I'm talking about, so I don't even need... That's how everyone knows that story. Uh, but it's, what was interesting about that story, and you, you sort of touch on it in the book, but basically you were done over by a friend in that. So you went out with a friend and yeah. had a night out yeah. and had some drugs and, and stayed out all night. And then he sold the story to the... To the news of the world. So, yeah, yeah he was an, a, a friend. Um, you know, we're not still friends. No. Um, but he sold the story to the news of the world, and the news of the world said to him, well, you need evidence, because we've been out. I think we've done two grams of coke. And yeah. he said, you need... Because uh, we're not on the BBC here. I could just be a <laughs> you bit can more say blunt, you can't can. I? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so two grams of coke. And he, they said, well, we need evidence. And he spoke to Max Clifford as well. Right. In home. <laughs> Rest in peace. Um, uh, uh, and Max Clifford said, well, record the phone call. So my friend called me, and my friend was recording. It's sort of like a forerunner to phone hacking. Yeah. So the embryonic stage of phone <laughs> hacking. But he recorded the phone call. And he said, so I'd rehearse. He'd say, that was a big night, wasn't it? Where did we go again? How much coke did we do? And I'd rehearse all the details. And I remember the worst bit was the line where I said, I'm still sniffing now. And that was like one of the... You know, you get those sub-headlines in yeah. the paper. And it was just a bit grotty. Yeah. But then he got 20 grand for that. Yeah. 
It's not very much, is it? No, I mean, it was 98. Was it a lot then? I don't know. Not really, not, I mean, not to betray your... I mean, I don't know how good friends you were. No, but that's... No. I mean, again, like, when these... I mean, I think what's interesting about that story, and I think possibly why your career almost blossomed after it, really, is rather than, the, yeah. rather than it being the end of your career... Is well, it got me onto the big breakfast, which was yeah. a, a never well, every, there, Everyone felt it was unfair at the time because it's like, you know, why pick on one person taking cocaine in show business and aren't all the journalists taking cocaine? Yeah. So, and isn't Max Clifford having sex with children? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but so once you get, but it's, it sort of felt so unfair, but then that's so, but so it's, it's, it's weird. The irony is some of the details of his phone calls coming out. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the details of his phone calls coming out where he'd pretend to be someone else? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, to a degree of hypocrisy in that lots of journalists take drugs. Um, yeah. But I never. Well, and everyone, you know, why pick on one person in show? I, mean, I, I, I was talking to uh, last get, week's guest, Carrie, yeah. about it. And she, uh, last week, I was so excited about you coming on last week, I was still talking about it. And, um, and you know, she was saying that happened now, she didn't think it would even cause a, an issue, which I'm not sure if, if a blue pizza presenter was, was caught taking drugs, I think it might do, but, I, but I'm not sure, because I think it, it felt like, a, maybe felt like a bigger deal at that time, it meant people hadn't been, hadn't, yeah. you know, but now it feels like most people... Well, know. I think what I've done is I've lessened the impact for other people, yeah. in a way. <laughs> So I have enabled future Kids TV presenters yeah. to take drugs <laughs> with impunity. Yeah. And let that be my legacy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good legacy. <laughs> I, know, I, th I, I, don't, I sort of find that fascinating, that betrayal, and that betrayal for a relatively a small amount of money. And then, yeah. you know, if he'd come to you and said, will you give me 21 grand not to tell the news of the world about this? Uh, you know, you might have done, you might have said, okay. He must have been uh, jealous, I guess. You know, we come down from Nottinghamshire together and I was, you know, presenting Blue Peter, which yeah. was a big thing, and I think it was je jealousy maybe more than money to him. Right. But although there was that hypocrisy of, well, journalists obviously take drugs, for me, it was pretty straightforward. I thought it was reasonable, you know, that they had to sack me. I'd been caught. You know, I, I remember yeah. going, they called me into a meeting with the head of Children's BBC, uh, and she said, come to my office. So it was Sunday, paper comes out Sunday, midday Sunday, come to my office. And I remember standing outside the lift and because I got there first, she came out and she came out with the head of HR who was holding my contracts. Yeah. And you're like, I'm, right, I think I know where this is going. <laughs> and then I sat down in the office with him and I just said, look, let's not waste any time here. I have to go. Yeah. So I, I, you know when you've got to go sometimes. Yeah. Because two, you know, I don't know much about cocaine, so when he said two grams, that doesn't sound very much to me. That's like, I'm thinking of in terms of pick and mix, that would be, that's not, that's hardly anything, right? So it, it seems an overreaction. Two grams, that's nothing. I, uh, I think it weighs anything, does it? Two grams. The headline, no, the headline was uh, Blue Peter Presenters 12 Hour Vodka and Cocaine Binge. Yeah. And it was a rare example of tabloid understatement, because actually it was. <laughs> It was nearer 20 hours, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, it sort of took a bit of a chance having you on Blue Peter, don't you think? I mean, you'd, yeah, come, I think you'd so. come from kind of quite, you from, know, you come from live TV yeah. and it quite boisey, laddish sort of throwing. Was it Damon Albin threw beer on you or you threw beer on him? Or? Yeah, yeah, he threw it on me, yeah. you know, chasing down the street. I got involved yeah. in lots of stunts. We talked earlier yeah. about getting back from Parliament. Yeah. I think they did, they acknowledged that they took a risk on me and some risks, Richard, don't pay off. <laughs> 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 Inherent in taking a risk, it might not work out. Uh, and so I was replaced by a guy who was the uh, son of a vicar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them, you know, a lot of comedians are sons of vicars and sons of headmasters, so it's not. It's not. It's, not, it's, not, it's fine. No, you should try and get a job on Blue Peter. I should, well, I would yeah. like would be very nice. I'd like to be on. I mean, no, there's a lot of nice uh, Blue Peter. I, lo I love Janet Ellis, so I'd love if I could travel back through time. And B, I'd, I'd actually go on Jigsaw rather than Blue Peter. Right. If I could, if that was a power I had, yeah. I would go back to that. To, Janet Ellis was my favourite, but she was also mired in controversy. She was, you took the heat off her a little bit because she got pregnant while she was she got unmarried. Pregnant. Yeah, that's true, yeah, she got Is pregnant. Is that worse than taking cocaine or better than I taking I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly think so. Because cocaine, if I, uh, I'm, uh, means you can't have sex often, doesn't it? Because it makes you uh, 
it makes you uh, unable to get an erection after a while, so if you take enough of it, as I understand it. <laughs> so, um, well, I can confirm that's definitely true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I'm very free now, yes. so I admit that I've taken drugs, whereas yeah. no one else really likes to think it publicly, yeah. do they? It's liberating. It is liberating. Well, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, people should just be honest about it. I mean, there were, there, were, there were worse things going on in children's television, and uh, let's, that's just saying, uh, let's just say. Uh, so you, well, I'm glad, I'm, you are from Mansfield, and what I like about your book, you're fascinated with one of the same things as I'm fascinated with, which is uh, the tales of Robin Hood in Nottingham. Oh, yeah. Which uh, was my, always my favourite. We used to go every tour and go, and go around the town. It's, it's no longer there, sadly, now. But what we liked about it was as you went in, it was quite bad. It was like, a, you give me a fact that I didn't know about it in your book, which is quite interesting. Uh, you maybe can relate if you can remember it, but uh, it's like a, a little train ride around uh, uh, some bad shop windows of shop window dummies of uh, the sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, but at the start, in the first room, there's a voiceover, and it goes, "You are about to leave behind your humdrum lives." <laughs> I I always felt that that was making an assumption about my life <laughs> that, they, that I don't they can make in a voiceover. I think my life is better than the tales of Robin Hood. <laughs> I think I was about to go into a slightly more humdrum thing and then go back to my yeah, yeah, more yeah. interesting life. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> but but I was, it's a Tesco's now. It's a Tesco's now. It's gone. It's really sad. Yeah. Um, and these are the carriage that carried people round. Yeah. Uh, it, they'd got it from an abattoir. That's they bought it second say, yeah. from an abattoir, yeah. hadn't they? And so it was these carriages that used to carry animals to their deaths. We're now carrying you <laughs> <laughs> into a more or less humdrum life, depending on your perspective. Because there's one in York that's quite good, a medieval one. It's all, they, they have the smells of the time, don't they? That sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So that fact, by the way, that bit of my book, that was when I attempted a very bad... I, did, I tried stand-up, uh, and it was terrible, and I did it once. It's such a bad idea. And the night before I did it, I interviewed you. you, you did, I, yeah. I was on Radio 5 Live, I had a show there. You came on the night before. I interviewed you in the Pleasance Courtyard, and you said... It's a terrible idea. <laughs> Stand up's really hard and you shouldn't do it. <laughs> and I was correct. <laughs> this happens, it happens a lot where a journalist, this happens all the time, like it's usually in print journalists, will go, yeah, I had a crack at doing stand-up. And then A, sometimes it just goes well the first time because yeah. you're, you're quite geared up and you've only got to do five minutes and often it depends on what gig you choose to do. You chose a ridiculous time to do a gig, which was at the end of a Reg D Hunter. He'd already done 90 minutes, hadn't he? Yeah, yeah. Quite a big venue, wasn't it? Yeah, other big, like wasn't an 800-seat venue of people who hadn't come to see you had already seen the show they wanted to see. They were drunk. Apparently not enjoyed it all that much anyway. Yeah, then, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and then you come on and do... You meant to do five and you did 13. And, and I'm sure <laughs> I'd have given you the advice, learn what you're doing and don't do anything else and don't ad-lib and do the jokes and fuck off. And, uh, I, and it was live on the radio, so you had all those sort of annoying restrictions of being live on BBC Radio. I mean, it was flawed in so many ways. And it was kind of overwhelming, and then my memory started, so I just lost what was going on, and yeah. it, was, yeah, it was awful. Um, and then but what was good about the radio show was we then I went, came off stage, thank you, good night. I didn't do a mic drop, but I walked off stage, there was some polite applause, went back to my little studio, and we did a phone-in, which was, how did you think it went? <laughs> uh, the answer was terrible. <laughs> It was brave to do that. <laughs> you a, see, I thought when I interviewed you, I remember now, the, the night before, when I interviewed you in the Pleasance yeah. Courtyard, I thought you seemed a bit annoyed that I was even attempting it. Like, it because it is hard stand-up and it is a craft and you have to practice it. And I think, I think you were, you were, you, were you annoyed? I don't think I was annoyed. I I, it, it sort of does, I don't think I'm annoyed at you having to go because you're funny and I think that's kind of an interesting thing to do. I, don't, I find it, I've done it slightly insulting that people think it would be that easy. So that, uh, that often happens. But, you know, and I think, but I think that of all those talent shows on TV as well, they would never do, uh, do you want to be a TV executive superstar thing, would they, where you come on and choose the TV, because they go, oh, no, that's a very hard job to, to do that. But, oh, yeah, do you want to be a singer? Yeah, go and have a go and see. Go and have a crack and then do it. And so I think, I think any of those things that sort of... I think it's stupid, because you're cutting... You're cutting I think with the X Factor and stuff, you're, you should be building up to becoming a singer, which I think many of them are anyway, and then they, they're picked out of a... A group, aren't they? But you know, just just try and get instant success, which I know isn't what you were trying to do. No, 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 not at all. I, I was, and also why I felt slightly sad that I thought you were annoyed with me is because I thought you were annoyed because you thought maybe I think stand up is easy. And actually, even before that experience, I had a lot of respect for stand up. And I'm aware that it's it's a hard job. Yeah, it's just a hard job, stand up. I don't think I just thought you would definitely would definitely go badly. But I can't I can't really yeah. remember the interview, so I think that's all. I can remember being in the present court. I can't remember what I said, but I. You know, I thought you were stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's what your whole life... 
That's what your life. <laughs> but, so you worked in McDonald's in Mansfield? Yeah. When you were a youngster before? Uh, you... Yeah, yeah, I worked in McDonald's in Mansfield. And um, that was where my girlfriend dumped me at McDonald's in Mansfield. I was serving on the till. And it was quite callous. I mean, she came down and she actually let me start the order. So I think, one, why don't you wait till I'm off shift? But she queued up, gets to the front. <laughs> Started the order, which I doubt, don't touch actually like um, fries and a milkshake. And they said, Oh, listen, by the way, I've been thinking, I don't think it's working out. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, you what? He said, No, I just don't think it's working out. And I think we should um, call it a day. And I, I'm like, So do you, want, do you still want these fries? And then I sort of gave her the food she paid. And, uh, and I went into the back room and cried my eyes out. I sat on a box of gherkins. <laughs> <laughs> Or as McDonald's calls them, pickles, and, and cried. It was considerate of you, because they're quite salty anyway, so that would, that would, <laughs> would, not, would not affect the taste of the burgers. That is. In Ma Mansfield is um, quite a rough town, um, yeah. which has been quite good for our family, because my dad's a criminal defence lawyer. Um, but it's just, um, a lot of crime. <laughs> um, uh, I, you would often have to go to court as a witness when you worked at McDonald's in Mansfield, yeah. because people would just... Have fights, and I did take someone's order. This is not an exaggeration. They were having a guy was having a fight with another guy, and he'd got the other chap in a headlock, and he was banging his head against the counter in front of me, whilst trying to give me an order. And did the guy who was having his head banged against it try and give an order as well? <laughs> I don't like strawberry milkshake. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you an emergency question that I've changed, especially for you. I made it slightly different. Um, would you rather have a hand made out of bacon? <laughs> or a cock made out of herring? <laughs> and when I say that, the, the cock will actually be a living herring. <laughs> the, tail, the tail will be above the... You'll still have testicles, but there will be... The tail will be here, yeah, and then it'll just be a big flapping. I mean, it'll be big. It's a big fish, the herring, flapping around. Or you can have a hand made of bacon. You can eat bacon, and it'll grow back. And you can eat bacon any time. Or you can have a cock that is a live herring, right? And then you know, I would think that would have some advantages. Well, just, you know, crash. It'd be quite exciting for to make love with someone with that, wouldn't it? They would. They would enjoy the experience. Well, imagine, I'm not, I'm not a woman, but I'd imagine that would be <laughs> thrashing around. There is a very clear answer to this, which yeah. is you, you'd have the hand made of bacon yeah. because uh, herring is a, a very particular taste. You know, yeah. most people don't like herring, whether it's a live herring, a pickled herring, a grilled herring. I don't think really you get happen. much oral sex with no, that. That's, I, that's the point. It's not. It's a lie. It's a raw herring. That's true. I mean, the oh, but maybe from some. Um, Icelandic and <laughs> no, no, Scandinavian no. people would enjoy that. Yeah, but that's true. But if what you're saying is, if you like oral sex, and most people yeah. do, why would you want to only limit the possibility of oral sex to a handful of Icelandic people? <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so it's a handmade of bacon. Yeah. Be nice. It'd be good, wouldn't it, having a handmade of bacon? Well, bacon is delicious. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and then you'd be able to, also, you'd be able to go, I'm, hi, I'm Richard Bacon, and you could wave. <laughs> and that would be like your gimmick. People would remember you because of the bacon thing. Well, there was ever a problem at school that you, you should have worked at live TV. That's the okay, sort of idea they commission. <laughs> <laughs> was ever a problem at school for you being called Dick Bacon? Uh, <laughs> no, you would have thought so. Yeah, because well, I, no, I, I would have thought Dick Herring would have. We should do a double act. You could call it the Two Richards. Yeah, that's quite good. <laughs> or Herring and Herring and Bacon. I think that's all right. It's like a nice. It's like well, a we just put a whole band together of people who's got food as a surname, yeah. right? We could have a, a massive like Annika Rice. We yeah. get it in there, and I can't think of anyone else. <laughs> Tim Curry. Bang. Yeah. Uh, Simon Arctic Roll. <laughs> He would be good. Can you breathe out of your eye? Can you really breathe yeah. out of your eye? Yeah, yeah, I can try now. I mean, Let's I'm, do it. I don't just have to clear my eye. I'm, I I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't give you any warning about this to prep. I didn't know there would be I've not showered thing. today okay, because yeah. I got to bed at seven. I know, you don't need to tell me. I can smell that herring <laughs> penis a mile off. <laughs> uh, it is working. I don't know whether you'll be able to hear it. Let's try it. Thanks. 
Oh, at last, we've uncovered his talent. <laughs> Are you at, where's the air going into when you do that? Does it, it come comes into, out the corner here? It comes yeah. out the corner. Um, I think it's the same defect as that. Remember the girl who could cry milk on TFI oh, Friday? Yeah, I yeah. think it's basically the same thing. Wow. Um, and when I was at school, I was quite a cheeky kid at school. Yeah. And I discovered it because my friend, or my friend's making use of the laugh, or Teddy McCann, the teachers, and I would hold my nose to disguise my laugh. So I thought this was a way to like not laugh out loud. Right. And then this air would shoot out my eye. <laughs> Uh, and that in then would attract the teacher's attention, but that's how I discovered it. I've got a squeaky arm. One of my eyes squeaks. Let's see if I do. <laughs> but the other eye doesn't. That's actually quite loud. <laughs> I don't, I, if anyone knows if that's serious, <laughs> it's, always, it's always been the. It's really weird, isn't it? No, no, it's it's one weird. Of it, my sounds, eyes. it sounds like there's like a moving, a loose metal part <laughs> in your eye. Which does sound serious. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we'll find out. Look at we that. <laughs> we've got defective eyes and food and surnames. <laughs> we've got, you know, God. and we're both this called is, Richard. This is working we've up really to really hit it off. <laughs> I do a feature that you featured in quite a lot called uh, Desert Island Dicks. Right. Where you, you have to name the eight Richards you take to a desert island. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a tortuous process. I mean, it sounds quite long. <laughs> it does. It's, yeah, can, can you give it a go. You're already there. I'm already there. Because I'm the luxury rich uh, I'd Richard. take Richard Dawkins. Yeah, would you? I mean, yeah. I, oh, well, I can't uh, get him. No, I'm not. Because I, I, th I'm, I'm like the Can backlash to the backlash. I think there's a thing now, because we're both atheists and we've talked about being atheists on the radio a lot, but I, I've decided I want to defend Richard Dawkins. Because there's a thing now, if you're an atheist, the thing you do is you say, I'm an atheist, oh, but that Richard Dawkins. Whereas, take, tell me one thing you disagree with in The God Delusion. There's not I one don't know. Thing. I love his book. I love his. I love his books. I, I, I prefer Stephen Jay Gould, who I think has a more is more of a human being, rather yeah, than a like strange automaton. <laughs> yeah, but he's called Stephen, so he can't. That's true. He can't, but he can't come. But I don't like it. Uh, if you should take him to a desert island, it means he couldn't wouldn't go on Twitter anymore, which would be good. Because <laughs> I just don't like his Twitter feed. Twitter's a bit, yeah. a bit weird. But I think that he's had a, a huge impact on the perceptions of faith. And yeah. I, I think he's quite brave, and I quite admire him. I do, I, that's why I just wish he would shut up <laughs> <laughs> about Islamophobia I, and retweeting his own praise. What did he say last year? I, I interviewed him um, on stage at the Cheltenham Science Festival. Oh, yeah. uh, and he said, he was talking about, he basically said, you should really, you can tell your kids about Santa, but you should also introduce some scepticism into yeah. it. Which he was quite rational the way he explained it. And I got to see how his life works. And the next day, all the papers went for him with the headlines, First he killed God, <laughs> now he's going after Santa. Yeah. But I remember him saying to me, uh, uh, he said, he said, look, the thing is, Rich, I know you've got a, a son, uh, Arthur, and my son at this point was three, I think. And he said, so if you take the story of the princess turning into a frog, you know, he said, well, you should, Rich, by all means, Richard, read the story to him of the princess turning into a frog. But at the end of it, say to him, it's not impossible that a princess could turn into a frog. Um, it's never been witnessed, uh, and it is thus statistically unlikely <laughs> that it will ever happen. And it uh, would take a tr probably a trillion years of evolution, backwards <laughs> evolution, <laughs> to get there. Yeah, he's a dick. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so he belongs on Desert Island Dicks. Dicks, that's one. Seven to go. This is a tortuous it process. It is tortuous. Isn't it? Because also, because I went to bed at 7 a.m., I can't even really think of any more I know, Richards. that's what's good about it. So, I mean, you think someone called Richard would know, have loads of Richards. I can think uh, of loads, because, you know, I'm, I'm prepped for this. Do they have to be alive? Nope. Richard Dimbleby. Okay. Is that yeah. the father, the, the old... Yeah, book? David's yeah. father. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first reporter into Belson at the end of the war. I mean, he's an amazing broadcaster, Richard. Um, and I'm more like Richard May. I'm only saying Richard Mayde because he's come into my head. Yeah. That's not that, not that you can't choose just... You can't just start naming people called Richard. It's got to be that the eight Richards you would take to a desert island. That has to be reasoning. To be, to be fair, that does seem to me to be the premise of the feature. <laughs> because no one has a capacity to remember more than eight Richards in their head anyway, so all you're going to do is name Richards. Yeah. Well, then, you know, you can play it that way if you want, but it will be again. It's hard, it's hard isn't it? Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I mentioned this in the last podcast, but uh, I enjoyed when you had a polyp on your th uh, oh, throat. Yeah. I did, yeah. Uh, and yeah. I enjoyed the fact that someone at the Daily, Daily Express, A, turned it into a story. Yeah. 
that you were having, and then you talked about it on your radio show, and a man said on the Daily Express page, I don't spend more, more than £130 a year on a licence fee to listen to Richard Bacon prattle on about his ill health. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was, you know, short-sighted of him in terms of that isn't all the... He could listen to something else on the BBC. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not... I mean, it'd be quite good if it cost £130 a year for that service. Would yeah. you consider charging £130 to people per year, and then they can listen to you prattle on about your ill health. Yeah. No, he, he, yeah so in his head, the entirety of the licence fee <laughs> yeah. has been funneled into that into that's you 90 seconds, yeah. where I talked about a polyp, which I talked about because my voice sounded weird, <laughs> therefore it needed explaining on the radio. Mm. But that was, um, I, yeah, so a polyp is where you, you sort of rupture, a, not quite a blood clot, clot right. but you cause a tear on your vocal cords. And I got it by singing uh, uh, at a Take That concert. It was Never Forget. <laughs> right. Can never forget? It was a New Year at the O2. Ironically, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, singing, I was singing very loudly and I broke my vocal cord. And, it, and I, I had an operation. And as the um, surgeon was putting me under, and it was, you know, I could do it, just a needle goes in and they go count down from 10. And I said, so it's going to be right. And he, as I was going under, he said, I mean, he said there's about a 20% likelihood you won't be able to speak again. <laughs> and I was like, they're not that good odds, right? They're not that. I mean, I, all I do for a living is talk. Yeah. It's all I do. Um, and then I had a brief experience, I guess, of what it's like to live with a disability because I couldn't talk for two weeks. I wasn't allowed to talk for two weeks. Yeah. And I carried a sign around with me. And people were just kind of misunderstood what it meant. So I went to, I was in Heathrow Airport and I was trying to get into the business lounge. And they went, you've got your card. Uh, and I hadn't got my card. My wife had got my card. And I couldn't really uh, explain because I couldn't talk. And so I showed her the sign, where the sign said, I've just had uh, an operation, and therefore I can't talk. And, and she looked at me and she said, have you got your card <laughs> to get into the lounge? Um, so it's a brief insight into yeah. uh, how stupid people are. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You, do, you live a very showbiz life. You're always going you know, into airport lounges. <laughs> the Not on that occasion. Up. OK, you can get in, yeah. Your face isn't your fortune in that case. Then <laughs> it's when you've been, you've worked like so. You've been you, we started on like live TV was like nineteen ninety three yeah, or something. Two. I don't know six maybe. I maybe think six yeah, for me, yeah. yeah, it was the middle, wasn't it? So it was, yeah. So you've been working fairly constantly on TV and radio. Yeah, I mean I've done more radio. The last ten years I've done mainly radio. Um, I now live in America, and I sort of live between LA and London, and about to live. To, I'm taking I'm doing a job in New York for the next two months, so I'm. Sort of living between LA, New York, and London. And the How's it going in America? Have you, have you broken America? I don't know. I've broken America. <laughs> I start, I, the first thing I'm doing on air is uh, for ABC uh, News, which is a show I'm presenting, which starts a week after next. I mean, I went to LA in January. Yeah. And I had uh, two shows to do out there, one of which I had come up with. And it had been commissioned. Like, this is quite an extraordinary thing where you come up with a show and it gets commissioned and it's a, the format was mine, it's an interview series, but it's my format. And we're all set to film it, it's in New York for American telly and my visa got held up at the embassy and I couldn't get my passport back. And so I had to, five days out, I had to cancel the whole show, which cost a TV production company 200 grand. And there were five crews in the edit suites of books. And it's kind of a, because you know how hard it is to get an idea away. Yeah. The first meeting I had in America, I get an idea away and it's commissioned and it's happening. It will never happen again in my life. <laughs> and I had to cancel the whole thing. The guest, who's a very, very, very famous comedian, yeah. is already in New York. <laughs> They're all there. And so, and I was partly moving there on, the, on that basis. And yeah. then there's a second show I couldn't do for a similar reason. So I had a weird start. And then, then I've then diverted back here. So I've, I think I've flown back to London nine times this year. So I've been all over the shop. Yeah. Because like you, I, so I was on. You did Steve Wright's show, was that right? I, uh, yeah, I sometimes so fill in for Simon Mayo on the Radio Two Drive Time show. Yeah, and I just I got you on because I like you. Did you fly back especially to do the Simon Mayo show from, or were you in London anyway at that point? I don't think <laughs> BBC Radio really pays enough. Because I am not paying over one hundred thirty pounds a year <laughs> to have you flown over from America <laughs> to do a show. That they could just put an old one out with Simon Mayer, couldn't they? It's yeah. the same every day. <laughs> That's good, but it's the same. Good I think with those. I think I listen to those. I listen that afternoon because often I'm driving, and you know, and sometimes I listen to Steve Wright, 
Same show every day. I like him a lot, but it's, fuck, it's just the same thing. <laughs> and then Simon Mayo, it's almost exactly the same show. They could, I, I really think they could save some money by just repeating them. <laughs> on a year, just wait, oh, it's Easter, put out the Easter one. His audience yeah. aren't going to know. I mean, it's very difficult for me to comment, Richard, because I quite like fitting in there, and I quite like to work for Radio 2 in the long term. Okay. So I'll just let you talk, and I will, I will observe. It's incredible Steve Wright keeps, it's still got that job, though, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's, there's no getting him out of there, but it's, he's got that for life, hasn't he? He's there for life. A lot of listeners. I know, but it's great. I mean, I like, I listen to him. I, li- I really like him. I think he's one of the best radio interviewers there is as well. Yeah. Um, but it's just incredible, you know, it's just incredible. That just goes on. It's phenomenal radio in terms of how many people listen. That Steve Wright gets like seven million listeners or something. It's, a, it's an amazing number of people who are listening to a radio at two in the afternoon, mm. isn't it? It is, but it's the same, exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> like to the, the mu- where the music plays, where the fake cheers come in. <laughs> what I like about it is... I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just observing, I'm not commenting. I listen to it, I'm just fascinated by it, but I, I really like Steve Wright. That fucking hell, he's lucky. <laughs> oh, lucky bastard. Uh, did you keep the uh, Blue Peter annual that got pulped after you sacked from the show? Because that's worth a lot of money now. Yeah, uh, I've got one somewhere, I think. Okay. Uh, uh, when you um, get sacked from Blue Peter, it's a bit like uh, losing your job with the LAPD, because you have to hand in your badge. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a really sad moment um, and uh, I don't think I did keep the ending but they did pulp it because it turned out it had when you, some of the, like, the headlines sounded like they could be puns for taking drugs there was one about snow there was yeah. like there was a chapter called Racing the Dragon and that was you know, they had to get rid of it I saw some people on Facebook discussing Blue Peter annuals and that, they said that they're all quite Common apart from that one, so that one is worth. If you've so got it one, is really. If you've got one, they're all pulp. So you know, if you've got one, if you could sign it as well, it's probably going to be worth even more. Oh. If you could sign it with some cocaine, <laughs> <that> would, <laughs> <laughs> you could burn some cocaine onto it, onto the front cover. Um, your book's quite candid about the fact you wrote the uh, film reviews for the Sunday People, but you didn't write, ever go and see the films or write the, write yeah, the reviews I, yourself. I, uh, what, so, yeah, in, that, in my book, <laughs> I, did, I did talk about that, which I thought was brave in a way, because I thought yeah. maybe people will th- think I've not written the book if I'm writing about not writing my newspaper <laughs> yeah. column. But um, I did write the book, but the People column... So the, 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 pe- <laughs> the People is a Sunday newspaper. Um, uh, I've no idea if it's still going. Um, and I had the film column in there, and when I got the job, I thought, Easy, you, can, you, you can imagine thinking, oh, that's quite an exciting job, you know, you see three films a week, and then you just write essays about them, and that sounds like a lovely job. And so I did it, for, and after about three weeks, I, actually going to a screening at two in the afternoon to watch most films are terrible. It turns out that most films are terrible. Are terrible. In your way, when you get the job, you make the mistake of thinking every film is Spectre, right? <laughs> but actually, a lot of them are about a dog coming down from space or something. You know, they're just nonsense. And so I start, I would go see the film and write the column for three weeks. Then on the third week, I got my friends to go and see the films. And then we'd like sit and write the films together. And then I got bored of that. And so I just got him to go to the cinema and write the column. Then he got bored of going to the <laughs> cinema as well. So he used to sort of write them from having read some other stuff on the internet. And then, and then not only did I not write my film column, I didn't read it either. <laughs> and I, I remember walking through Soho and a director came up to me. He said, I'm a director. And he made a film, it was something like Bike Ride to Brighton or something. I mean, this is what I mean about not every film is Spectre. And he came up to me and he was really upset and he just said, why didn't you like my film? And I said, ah, film again. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, it was, you have to remind me, it was too short, too long. Too... Um, and there was another time when I was sitting outside a restaurant somewhere near Soho and I, as a, there was a film PR I recognised. And I said, oh, why are you here? And she said, oh, Downstairs in the private room beneath where we are, Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock are in there. They're having a party. Um, they've got a new film out. I think it was called Lake House. The Lake House. You yeah. said it's a, it's a party for the Lake House. And I said, Oh right, I can't like to go to that party. Um, um, you know, is it um, is it a good film? Uh, and it, this was a Monday. <laughs> and she said, Oh, you wrote about it yesterday, Richard. <laughs> and, then she said, and then she said, Would you like to know what you thought about it? <laughs> I said, yeah, might as well tell me. 
caught red-handed and she said, you didn't like it very much. <laughs> and no, you're not going to the party. <laughs> There's quite a chancerous element to chancery. Chance. You're quite a chancer, is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's quite a bit. It's, that's, I mean, there, there is this element with show business of that. Obviously, there's, a, there's fakery within all elements of show business and journalism. And, mm. But, you know, you presume you're still taking some of the money for the, for between. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you, could, you, you could potentially make a good living not doing anything. You could sit back <laughs> on the bacon brand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I very much doubt. I mean, if I did a column again, I would write it. I'd just very bored of writing about films. But I suspect there are some columnists out there who have their columns written. Don't well, I you? think my um, friend uh, Emma Kennedy, who many of you are aware of, used to do film reviews. And she, I, I don't think it was you either. She said there was someone quite famous who did, never went to the screenings, who was never at the screenings. Never at the screenings. And, so they, yeah. and never wrote their own thing. I think quite a few of the. You know when they get famous footballers to do columns? Yeah. I, you know, I'm not well, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that they're writing any of those. <laughs> they probably call them, don't they? Someone yeah. calls them from the news desk, what do you think of this? And then puts a phone, a one minute yeah. phone call, and then they... Well, that, well Danny Dyer got into trouble, I think, didn't he? For, for he, did a, he did a column in a newspaper, like it was an, an agony aunt kind of column in one of the ma magazines. Yeah. And then one of them turned out to be something about basically beat up your girlfriend. He was, yes, I remember that. And then it, he probably hadn't written that himself or read it himself. Yeah. And so that's, where, that's the danger. Just be careful if you do it again. <laughs> you don't get caught out. Um, how's Una Stubbs to work with? Did you have a nice time? Oh, yeah, I yeah, presented an art show. <laughs> uh, she's lovely, Una yeah. Stubbs. She's, um, she's like a 76-year-old Shoreditch hipster. <laughs> you know, she just dresses brilliantly. She's lovely and cool. I got her around, so we co-presented a show... Um, in which uh, ten people, so the two judges, ten people, and they paint, and uh, one gets eliminated every week, and at the end of it, um, someone wins. And um, it's, it's the Bake Off, right, basically? Yeah. <laughs> we just didn't say it like that. I didn't explain it like that at the time. But, um, yeah, she came around to my house, and we had dinner before we shot it, and then I deliberately put on that episode of Faulty Towers that she's in. <laughs> Do you remember the one? It's the one yeah. where Sybil is ill in bed. Um, and so I find it quite... To me, too, I find you stuff really yeah. quite iconic. She was in Wurzel Gummidge. Yeah, I know. Don't you find anyone who was in Faulty Towers is quite exciting to me? Yeah. I, you were there. Oh, my God, you were in the room when th that happened, that thing happened. Yeah. And when it John is Cleese exciting. They're, most of them are dead now. Oh. It's terrible. It's, that's what I think about all the time, unfortunately. Uh, are you ever confused with the English Tory politician Richard Bacon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a the South Norfolk MP... Yeah. Uh, Richard Bacon. Yeah. I wonder if he ever gets confused for me. I wonder if they ever don't let him into the exactly, House of Commons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's dragged away by the parliamentary police. Um, I do get a lot. I mean, sometimes I get his mail. So, yeah, <laughs> South Norfolk MP, and I get his mail, and occasionally I write back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, it's a fascinating insight into the world of being an MP, because it is, you know, people writing about how their pipes are leaking from their house. I mean, I think that is the reality yeah. of being a backbench MP. <laughs> I used to want to be an MP. Did you? Yeah, I did. Um, and I'm quite glad that in the, instead of being an MP and dealing with people's leaky pipes, I'm yeah. just arsing around. I mean, that's my, my career does feel like, essentially, I just mess around the whole time. You know, it's, I mean, you've done lots of great things. No, I have. Well, I've done some... Quite good things, and yeah. I've done some nonsense, you know. Yeah. But yeah. it's good. It's good to be. That's good. No, that's not a bad thing. But it's sort of. It, it's. I think people. It's sort of interesting because I think there's this level of this level of really famous people in show business who you assume are billionaires and millionaires, yeah. and then there's a level of people in show business who you wouldn't think were millionaires. But I know how much you paid for your house in 2002 because it's in your book. <laughs> so I. Know. Oh, it's worth a lot more than that now, Richard. <laughs> yeah. So you. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean, I know. I, yeah. I was looking in Chiswick in 2002, so I know how expensive that house was. <laughs> <laughs> Bell Size Park. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, so what was your point, that I'm relatively know, you, wealthy? You're doing that, that do really well, aren't you? I, mean, I am, you do, yeah. Yeah, well, you've worked constantly for all that time, yeah. I suppose. So that there's, you know, it's kind of interesting, I think, that's all. So I'm just, yeah. in, I'm just interested. Well, Are well, you ever confused with HMS Richard Bacon? The <laughs> ship? <laughs> Is there a ship called HMS? Yeah, can, can you not know that? How could I not know that? I'd take my son, if I had a son and there was a ship named after me, I would take my son to that ship and go, that is my ship. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go in there any time. Are you ever mistaken for Richard Mackenzie Bacon, the English Whig uh, journalist and musician from the 18th century? 
No, but I love the fact that you've done this research. <laughs> yeah. I typed Richard Bacon into Google. Um, into Wikipedia, it's not into even Wikipedia. That. Okay, thanks. It's, it's quite moving. Yeah. You know, and quite boring. There's another one. There was another one I didn't, but I didn't bother writing it down. <laughs> Tell us about plate spinning, Bob. That's a good story. Well, that, yeah, that was on the Big Breakfast. That was. Uh, God, I used to love working on the Big Breakfast. I so I got sacked from Blue Peter. Got that job. Um, and I was, my main job on the Big Breakfast <coughs> was, I was out on the road. So I think there were jobs I've done well and jobs I haven't done well. I think I was good at that one. That was going around the country, knocking on doors, live in the morning. Uh, 7 a.m., <coughs> or about 10 past 7 would be the first hit, as we called it. And a lot of it, I did streaky bacon. And we'd often be on council estates. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'd knock on the door and I'd say, do you want to, in an hour, 10 past 8 in the morning, do you want to streak down your own street? We'll get all your neighbours out. And if you do it, you stream, <laughs> you run down naked. Your uh, private parts are covered by a plastic bit of bacon. And if you're willing to do it, you will win your own body weight in bacon. Everyone said yes. <laughs> Everyone said yes. Uh, and then... <laughs> I tell you, your body weight in bacon looks revolting. And, you, you, and then what would happen is we'd pack up and, they'd, uh, and we'd get like the local mayor to hand it over. And they'd win, and then you know, show's over at nine o'clock, and we'd have to give them their weight in bacon, and they'd turn up, they'd all have like these tiny freezers, and we'd have to go into the house, and they'd have no way of storing <laughs> all of this disgusting yeah. raw meat. Not organic meat, just cheap <laughs> rubbish. Um, and Play Spinning Bob was a guy um, who, he was on my very first outside broadcast for the Big Breakfast, and he, Turned up was a big day for me because I was a bit sacked. I've got it, you know. You very much want it to go well. And Johnny Vaughan was the presenter at the time, who I, I, I really admire and was a mentor to me. But he made snap decisions. And so your first outside broadcast is well, if he doesn't like me, I'm gone, right? So you're very anxious. And we booked a plate spinner for a feature called, I imagine it was called Bringing Home the Bacon. Yeah. Um, <coughs> <laughs> and it was like, knock on the door, and we, for some reason, we took this plate spinner to someone's house. And so we booked him from Liverpool and he turned up at 6 a.m. We're on air at 7. And he turned up and he's called Bob and said, hi, Bob, really excited, my first day, let's do this. And then he'd, um, he opened the boot of his car and he said, oh, he said, oh, I've forgotten the plates. <laughs> and it's like, it's like an aid memoir built into your job title. I mean, he's plate spinning Bob. So we, I mean, it's only if all we've got to bring are sticks and fucking plates, right? He brought the sticks. <laughs> so I thought, well, I, I can't, it's my first OB and I, I don't want Johnny to not like me and I've just got to go well. So I knocked on a different door because I couldn't knock on the door where they surprise people. No. And I said, oh, this is a really weird question. I know it's six in the morning, I've got you out of bed. I'm about to go and surprise those people for television. And a place been a set up in the Can I, is there any chance that I could use your plates? And so they gave us their plates <laughs> from their kitchen. I gave them to Bob, and then Bob said, oh, but the problem is, it turns out, you can't put any plates on the sticks when you plate spin. They have to have a little indentation. So we then had to borrow someone's drill, and we put these indentations in the bottom of the plates. And then we did the feature, and every single, because they were just the wrong plates for his sticks. <laughs> and they all just fell off, one by one by one. They all just fell off and smashed. And it was brilliant because it was a disaster. Uh, and so we had this idea, which is we take him to Vegas. <laughs> and, and I called up the Circus, Circus Hotel in Vegas, and I lied, and I said, We've got this plate spinner in, in Britain, and he is sensational. Um, and he's a huge hit on breakfast telly, and you have to book him. So I got him in the main stage at Circus Circus. <laughs> for like a thousand people. And we filmed it, and I went on and introduced him. And, and we can swear on here, do you know what I mean? The producer was a bit cunt-like. This time, he didn't forget his plates, but he couldn't bring them on the plane because they were too heavy. So we went and bought the plates from him, and we got that, and we deliberately bought really heavy plates. <laughs> Um, anyway, it was, it, was a, it was another disaster. <laughs> and for that reason, it was brilliant. <laughs> okay. Is he all right now? Has he recovered from this? Did he enjoy I mean, himself? I shouldn't have admitted that thing about buying heavy plates. It's way, although it has weighed heavy on my mind for That's a while. It. You're very good at getting these confessions I out am, of people, yeah. Richard. I am, yeah, that, one, that one's going to rank up there. <laughs> <laughs> I expect that'll be on the Australian news tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you an emergency question. If you had to go on holiday with one of the puppets from the Spitting Image show, um, 
but which, which puppet would you choose? Bear in mind that the puppet chooses the holiday destination. You don't have no choice over that. And also the puppeteer and the voiceover artist would come to operate it and make it speak, but you would never be able to interact with them as people. Well, this requires a level of knowledge of being in which I don't really have. Because okay. I need to, I would need to know who did the voices of each. You know. well, yeah, so I need to think about it properly. I need to give you a serious and a yeah. thoughtful answer. Um, I need, I need, I need to, to give it the answer it deserves, Richard. Do you want to come back next week? Yeah, let's come back next week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the Roy Hattersley puppet was funny. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it be funny for a week though? <laughs> that, like you know, a week. Of <laughs> 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 Still enjoying it? I think you're. I think you are belittling the impressionists' art there, Richard. It's a craft. I'm Roy Hatley. <laughs> no one knows what I sound like. Is Spitting Image funny if you go back and watch it? Um, I, never, I, you know, I wrote for Spitting Image. I did write back two sketches. For I didn't think it was as good as everyone no. went made out. I thought it sort of started. There were some controversies when they early on they did like um, the Queen Mother as Beryl Reed, didn't they? Yeah, and then that was like, oh, which is amazing. When you think about that's incredible that there was a point where the pr press would have gone crazy about someone doing a quite nice, gentle parody of the Queen Mother. Uh, but that was that was a big moment. There was definitely brilliant things in Spitting Image, but it all comes back. It's one of those things. It's the Del Boy falling through the yeah. Oh, it comes back it's the uh, what are the what about the vegetables? They'll have the same as me, isn't it? That's what it boils down to. But I think the. Uh the, the portrayal of John Major with, his, with Norma um, yeah. being, pushing the piece around the plane being really great, I think that had an impact on how he was perceived. So they, no, it yeah. sort of came, lifted out of comedy, wasn't it? Yeah. And actually framed how the public saw him. Well, I think Ma Margaret Thatcher herself was, I think she became, looked strong through, that, through those puppets. I think it was difficult for me because I was, to I was like writing a lot of topical uh, comedy at the time as I started my career. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have much respect for it as an art form because it's quite... Uh, formulaic. Do you mean that generally for writing top of the comedy? Um, no, not entirely. But a lot of those sketches were quite. Were, you know, we'd write for week ending, and which was a lot worse than Spitting Image. I think Spitting Image had lots of good things in it. Um, but it was, you know, people would go back and basically the same writers would write the same. You'd have, you know, even I wrote on week ending for a year and a half, and you'd be able to within six months you'd be able to pitch the same sketch with a different main person in it or yeah. just slightly, you know, it was it was it got a bit formulaic. So but in summary, Spitting, spitting quite, Image a bit shit. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> Can't no Can't no I don't I don't I don't I don't think it's you know it's, it's it's weird there's lots of comedy things that are of their time and I think maybe comedy should be of its time there are things that become classics and 30 years on people are still watching them and the things that I mean like Gavin and Stacey was uh, in the noughties or whenever it was on was everyone was going on about it but now I don't think anyone looks back at Gavin and Stacey and goes that is my favorite that, anyone no, so, so I mean, maybe they didn't at the time. It might, but it's, but it's it's interesting. Something can be like bang and then disappear, and something can be like only fools and horses, and everyone goes, "That's some, you know amazing forever," yeah. uh, or um, Tom Jones by uh, the the book by uh, no, my brain's no. not working. I like think this podcast will be forever, Richard. This podcast will go on. For, uh, it certainly feels like it will go on forever. It will go on forever, and well, we haven't even done an hour yet. Uh, I'm, I'm hosting the next show on today, so I can make this last as long as I like. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was good. I think it was spitting image was quite good. I'll ask you another question. Uh, this is another emergency question. See so how you get on with this. Okay. Um, I uh, kettle crisps are not as nice as they once were. <laughs> have I changed or have they? <laughs> That's not the question. No. If you could travel back in time to compare any food stuff of today with an equivalent in the past, A, what food would it be? B, what time would you go to? Gosh, that's interesting. Thank you. So this is... <laughs> God, that's really good. This is Ironically, I'd quite like to try bacon as well, because I think bacon was better in the 1970s than it is now. How could it be better than... Why would it be better in the 1970s? Because it's all full it's of... It's full of water then. Yeah. I mean, now it's getting in there. No, it's pumped full of water now. It used to be proper bacon. They'd just slice up a pig and give it to you in those days. Now... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The, pig, the pig wasn't even dead. <laughs> <laughs> it was delicious. But what would you choose? It's not up to me. I know, this is, I mean, this is a bit like one of those Giles Corrin, Sue Perkins kind of food shows, isn't <laughs> it? It is. It? This is like, I, I refer you to an answer I gave earlier, which is, it was my 40th birthday party <laughs> last night. I went to bed at seven. Yeah. I'm not sure I even slept then. 
I've basically come straight here yeah. from there, having had a couple more beers on the way. Yeah. And I just don't have the brain capacity. <laughs> Think about what food now I would compare with a food stuff from the past. It's not happening. Have you got any, got any more Richards lined up? <laughs> <laughs> Give me some time. All right, have you ever seen a ghost? What, do you think I believe in ghosts? Oh, well, I don't, you don't have to believe in one to see them. Yeah, you do. <laughs> now, that conceptually doesn't make any sense. You have to believe in a ghost to see you know, the ghost. I don't believe in you ghosts. You can't see... No, that's not true. I don't you can't believe say, in ghosts, but if a ghost came in now here and uh, I saw it, I would still see it. No, but then you don't know you wouldn't, because you would then, for you to see a ghost, yeah. you have to believe it's a ghost, therefore you believe in ghosts. So, if you don't believe in ghosts, you've never seen a ghost. Richard. <laughs> I, I'm prepared to have my viewpoint changed if a ghost comes in. If God, if God came down and said, "Hey, Richard, I am God, and I am re I am real, and this is the one, this is the correct one book you should be reading about me," <laughs> forget the other ones. I don't know why I haven't told everyone this, but I'm telling you. <laughs> Would sort out a lot of problems if I just said to everyone which one I was. But I don't. I like the problems, <laughs> so I'm not going to tell everyone else. I would then believe in God or think I'd had a psychotic episode. One of my <laughs> you know, more likely, but one of my favourite conversations that we've had on the radio <laughs> is when you were because I do this with my parents being an atheist, but you know, I row with my mum, and, and you've said the same before, where you like row with your parents, yeah. and at the end you you wonder why you're doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you know what what you're trying to achieve, you're just trying to make them. Un you know, you try. They've got some happiness in their life. And also, if you're right, if you manage to convert your parents to atheism and you're wrong and they get to heaven, God will go, sorry, you can't come in. They go, well, <laughs> I was religious for, 50, you know, for 80 years. <laughs> yeah, but then at the end, you changed your mind. Oh, so no. you can't, you've got to go to hell. It works the other way around, which is the beauty of Christianity. We could get to 80 and go, oh, no, I do believe now. And then God has to go, all right. Isn't that simple? Yeah, in you come. <laughs> Is it fine? That is so... Uh, Fred West's in heaven, because he probably just said sorry at the end. <laughs> I reckon Pope John Paul II, probably when he got Alzheimer's at the end, probably went, I don't believe in this anymore. He's in hell. Because of Alzheimer's disease. There's clearly going to be a lot better crowd in hell. <laughs> um, I think that... But I would round with my mum, and I, think, I do think, why, might, like, why would I want to win this argument? What am yeah. I trying to achieve? So at the end of it, she doesn't believe in God anymore, and then she's a bit less happy. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's about being right, though, isn't it? That's it is the... basically being right. <laughs> Can I prove that I'm right? Do you know um, how old Noah lived to be? Pardon? Do you know how old Noah... How Noah's old Noah was? He was quite old, wasn't he? Isn't it like 945? I think, but isn't a lot of that just that they were trying to make the time frame work? It goes back to Archbishop Usher, who decided that the world began on the 25th of October, you know, sometime BC because he'd worked out everything, and I think they had to make certain people certain ages to... Right. I think, like, Methuselah probably was in the Bible as being old, but I'm not sure Noah's age was actually in the Bible. Uh, are you following the American presidential election? Uh, very vaguely, via watching Saturday Night Live sketches, uh, yeah. so I, without knowing who they are referring to, which I quite... <laughs> apart from Donald Trump, who I do. Yeah. I, so I watch it really closely. It's pretty yeah. much all I read. I'm about to start working for ABC News, and we talk about it a lot, but I... Um, it's gripping, and there's a guy called Ben Carson, who's a neurosurgeon, so therefore technically a scientist, and he believes the Earth is, you know, 6,000 years old. Yeah. And he thinks the theory of evolution uh, is propagated by... The Satan came up with it. Yeah. The Satan came up with the theory of evolution. <laughs> and he's a neurosurgeon. Yeah. And it's kind of... It's just a baffling concept. <laughs> he's... A neurosurgeon. Yeah. He's just a, just a brilliant uh, humorous piece in The New Yorker. I think it was a sort of ironic piece. Where other brain surgeons have come forward and say, this is just such good news. This takes the pressure off us. Because we're brain surgeons, people think we're like super bright. I know everything. <laughs> we go to dinner parties. And it's exhausting. And at last, <laughs> they realise we only know one thing. <laughs> All the pressures is back on the rocket scientists yeah. now. <laughs> It is great, but it's incredible. But then I think, oh, the, the American pre the way all democracy is going now makes me think democracy is probably not the right way to have a political system yeah. in the modern world. Because, A, people start voting... Because of TV, people start voting in idiots like they would vote. You know, it started with Big Brother, and then now Donald Trump is genuinely a potential president of the United yeah, States. And so that's insane, that you, that because... And that, and that people are then voicing an opinion, you know, we're going to decide whether we leave the European Union or not. Yeah. 
based on whether you think it's a good idea or not. Based on public opinion, which is not very well informed. Yeah, well, you know, they it's don't not. know. No one knows whether it's going to be better for them or worse. It's almost certainly going to be much worse for everyone. Yeah. But, you know, because they don't like people French. coming. They don't like foreign people. <laughs> yeah, no. Did you ever think of doing um, Francis Bacon when you went to France? <laughs> and no. said hello to Fran uh, French people <laughs> on Big Breakfast. Um, Francis Bacon. This is very similar to sort of, this is the level of conversation I was having at about half. <laughs> it was <laughs> look, neither of us have had any sleep. Yeah. You, you because you've been having fun, me because I've been cleaning snot off the face of a idiot child that I create <laughs> that I now regret creating. I, yeah. thought, I thought I was a god. But I've done this amazing thing and then <laughs> <laughs> I'm too hot. I, but I might die and it'll be your fault. She doesn't say that, she can't speak with us. Do you secretly think you were happier before you had a child? Uh, I don't know. I was very unhappy before I had a child. <laughs> oh, I'm now slightly less unhappy, but uh, still yeah. unhappy. <laughs> I know, I really like I love it. my kids, but I I'm no more or less happy. I like it a lot, but I think I left it later, and so I've absolutely got everything out of my system. <laughs> so no. I'm absolutely ready to have children, and I, li I really like it. Even the, I, I think was, that's what, even when she's uh, the, 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 when she's ill. The, just the thing is, oh God, this is horrible. She's ill and she doesn't understand what's going on. Yeah. Really, but, you um, very, I, like very, I just there must be quite a lot of people who secretly were happier before they had kids. Oh, yeah, it's lots. just a thing you can't say, right? But there's loads of research about this that's come out, which shows that people parents are at their happiest before they have kids and when their kids leave home. <laughs> 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 but no one says that. Like no. no one puts their name to that opinion. No. And it's about time someone did. <laughs> Are you the man to well, do it? Well, I'm getting close to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, there's, a lot, there's a lot that's annoying about it, but I think, um, you know, A, I'll be dead by the time she leaves home. So that's, I'm not going to... I'm in this for life. Mm. Uh, so that's quite good. There's no way out of this prison, you know. <laughs> I've got to stay with my wife, really, whatever, however well we're getting on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Probably just have some more kids just to, you know, make fill up the time. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, don't, I think a lot of people aren't. I know if I'd had kids when I was 20, I think I'd have, or, you know, in my, in my 20s, or probably in my 30s, I probably would uh, have, ha have harboured regrets, but I don't, uh, I don't, because I felt like I'd had enough of all the other stuff. And it's great. I, it's, I really, really like being a dad. But I've, it's new, isn't it, for me? I mean, it's only 10 months in, so. Yeah, 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 you know, I don't want to so go too far in case my wife yeah. chooses or my mother-in-law chooses to down or my children. <laughs> 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 the children, <laughs> the children will download it. It's always going to be there on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they're 18, I'm going to email them at the link. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it before then. Dad it wishes you would never been born. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, they're annoying. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they, they are. They're, they're, I think, I think they'll re re there'll be more for them to resent. I mean, I feel sorry that the world's going to be awful for them. Uh, that's my fear, is that either the climate or the World War Three and the radiation that's going to be coming with that, the threat of terrorism and all dying. Can we get back to the uh, Richard Bacons and the yeah. uh, dicks on the island? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll ask you another emergency question. Yeah. So, with this good, we got to the point now that we don't usually get to at about in about another 20 minutes, but there's time for us to get through it at the moment, so that's good. Go on. <laughs> have you ever have you ever seen a Bigfoot? <laughs> well, is that the, that was the, the question? In the that F I thought have was capital letters or no? It's I... a Bigfoot, the Sasquatch I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Which celebrity would you like to stroke your hair as you die? It's quite a nice thought. Yeah. Um, and these are hard questions for a man who hasn't had any sleep, but um, you know. Yeah. Well, have you, have you answered that question yourself? I chose you? Bounce of the Dog from Neighbours for some reason. <laughs> but I think I was in a similar state of, you know, being out of my head with drunkenness or tiredness or something when I answered that. But I would quite, just be quite nice to... Yeah, and does Bounce of the Dog count as a celebrity? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in fact, to be honest, if I had the choice between you and Bounce of the Dog to interview now, fucking Bounce of the Dog would yeah. be there. <laughs> so... Gosh. And he would be a more eloquent and polite guest. 
You've been very good, Richard. I'm only thanks. joking. I've, I've thanks, had thanks, a long, long time. But I realise I haven't answered your question. No. Uh, Tina Hobley. Oh, yeah, yeah, Tina Hobley. Tina Hobley. Yeah. I've just... I think someone applauded that. <laughs> I did, thanks. Uh, I slightly pulled the name out of thin air. Slash, I used to have a sarcastic feature about her on XFM yeah. called How's Tina Hobley? In which my friend would impersonate Tina Hobley. And I would call up my friend impersonating her and I would say, hello, Tina, how are you? And he'd tell me how she was. And that was the entire basis <laughs> of, the, of the whole feature. It was very good. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that show ever won an award, Richard. No. I mean, that would be obviously an exaggeration. It's not up with Desert Island Dicks as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> no. But Tina Hobley is my answer. Okay, that's mm. good. I think it'd be nice. And I think she will outlive you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas she Bouncer, was at my Bouncer uh, has not outlived me, as I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing Bouncer. There might have been several Bouncers. Tina Hobley was at my birthday party last night. Was she? No, you're jealous. I am jealous. Why was I? No, you're thinking, why didn't I make the why cut? W- why <laughs> wasn't I invited? You get what I'm saying? Oh, you know, I'll be, it'll be my 40th birthday party the day before the podcast. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of us had to have some energy, Richard. That's the important thing. It's true. And unfortunately, neither of us uh, no. do. You are the most controversial top of the pops presenter there has ever been. <laughs> And I've been a top of the box presenter as well, so that you even top me in that you. Have you? Yeah, I've done, I did it twice. Uh, you called the magic numbers fat. Well, I didn't, Richard, uh, as you well know. <laughs> uh, so uh, the magic numbers came on, top of the pops. And for some reason, this day it was live, and I was rehearsing with Fern Cotton, who I was co presenting with. Yeah. And they were standing behind us. Um, and the link which had been written for me um, said that uh, this, uh, they're a family and they're a, they're a big melting pot of talent. And I ad-libbed, I said they're a big fat melting pot of talent. <laughs> but I meant P-H-A-T, Richard. And <laughs> well, I actually did mean that. I don't really believe yeah. me, I didn't mean that. And it was, it was in dress rehearsals and they walked off, they did the song for the rehearsal, they got off stage and they went to their dressing room, they're very upset. And they decided that they were going to leave. And so the executive police came up to me and said, like they're going, and we're, we're live in, you know, 40 minutes, and that's like, we've got a big hole in the show, we're on BBC One in 40 minutes, and a band are walking out. And so I, I thought, well, I said, it was Andy Peters who was the exec producer at the time, yeah, remember the kids presenter? And I said, Andy, I'll, let me go and smooth this over. <laughs> and so I, I found their tour manager, and I said, can I go and speak to the band? And he said, absolutely not. So I thought, I'll, I thought, I'll make a pitch to him. And I, I said, um, I said, look, uh, you know, I didn't mean it with an F. I meant it with a, a PH. Um, I hadn't even, I hadn't even seen them. You know, they're like, <laughs> you know, I was looking at the camera. I didn't yeah. know what shape they were. So I didn't mean it. And they're, you know, they're a great band. Um, and you know, we've got a hole in the show. Great opportunity for your band, of course, to be on top of the pops. So why don't you stay? And then oh, there's a word on here that I can't even. I don't think you even use on a podcast. But you said. Can. Can I? Yeah. All right. Do you know what the word is? No, but you can use any motherfucking word you want. All right. <laughs> he said, what you just did is the equivalent of having a black band on and introducing them as a bunch of niggers. Oh, no, you can't say that. I've got myself into trouble twice with the same incident. The same incident. Haunting me. That's it, you're quoting someone else. Yeah, that's true. That's so... You'll still be in trouble, though, because no, for, for some reason everyone just wants to get you, don't they? But they don't, they don't get no. you. You survive. You're like, a, you are like Jesus. Uh, <laughs> you're my, you're my, my personal Jesus. Can I just say, yeah. for legal reasons, I think it was a tour manager, but it could have been any number of people associated <laughs> with the band. Could have been any number, may not specifically have been whoever was a tour manager at that day. It seems very oversensitive of the magic numbers. I, I thought so. To um, like walk off the shot. I mean, like it's stupid of them as well because it's top of the pops. Yeah, we, yeah it was great for them. And also, when we did top of the pops, no one could. We were really rude about everyone, like, and we were allowed to write our own links. Uh, and uh, no, no one could. We E seventeen were you know, like behind us. Yeah. And we were just saying what we wanted about E seventeen and going like that. <laughs> and 
uh, and talking about how Brian Harvey had bought a, a big pack of. He said <laughs> we've been talking. We've been talking to Brian Harvey earlier on. He said he isn't a million. He said to the producer, he's not a millionaire, but I couldn't help noticing he was watching. He was eating a large bag of minstrels, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maltesers. Uh, so uh, <laughs> and then I then we yeah, so we were quite rude about. Them. Oh uh, well, yeah, but then I think maybe people would expect that of a comedian. Maybe. Rather Why than... just they couldn't hear us, that's all yeah, that's it. Well, you know, sometimes you don't quite know what's going to become a story. Let's yeah. say that band walked out. And the next day, it was picked up on by a lot of the newspapers. Right. And which surprised me. And then you don't... When it's in the newspapers, you have that slight nervousness of, I don't quite know where this is going. They very handily petered out. But it, that night, so it was in the papers that day, and that night I was on Channel 4 News, which I just happened to have on, and it's obviously a very light news day. And so imagine I was going walked out, and it's towards the end of Channel 4 News, obviously. And John Snow... So a picture of me came up behind him <laughs> and he said, former Blue Peter presenter Richard Bacon strikes again. <laughs> uh, and then I was number one. I was number one that year of the, the NME, had, it was called the top ten like cunts list or something. Yeah. And I was number one. <laughs> Pretty good. I mean, you're going to be in it. <laughs> It seems strange. It seems strange that th these things come back to. Do you think it's something about you? That I think that um, there's, just, there's quite a lot of chaos about me. I mean, I, there is. I I did quite a chaotic life, and uh, I think I think you're really. I really like you a lot. I have to say that. Uh, I think you're very funny. But why is it? Why do all these things? Do you think it's just because that first thing? It's very. You've, you've got, it's very difficult, and it's a good idea going to America. Now, is this part of your reasoning that no one there knows? Any of about that. Well, any of those no. things, but the Blue Peter won't mean anything to them, so that's nice to be able to start again, because you've got, like, this thing that will all, whatever, when you die, whatever else you've done, you say this in the book, anyway, but whatever else you've done, <coughs> that will be the first thing they say about yeah. you. I mean, if I, like... Unless you, like, kill some kids or something. <laughs> that's your only way out of... That's your only way out of it. <laughs> I mean, calling the magic numbers fat is not enough, that's what I'm saying. You didn't go far enough. <laughs> if you said the magic numbers aren't actually magic, <laughs> that might have been more controversial. It you wasn't, I mean? but that wasn't, but there's was another reason of going to America. But uh, in meetings in America, when you go and meet TV people there, they love that Blippi story. Right. I mean, they actually just find it really funny. And it yeah. doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't impede you in any way. They're no. great. The reason for going to America was more, we wanted to live in LA for a bit. And yeah. um, uh, my wife was a nanny to the Motley crew in Malibu when she was 18. And right. so she has this kind of romantic attachment, as you can imagine, to. Uh, Someone yeah, oh well. It's I do, right? And so, so we wanted to go back there. So no, was, that wasn't the reasoning. Um, and I'm so tired, I don't know where I'm going with the statement. Okay, I, did have so, I did have a destination, yeah. but it sort of dropped away. It's fine. It's all right, we're both, we're just two... We're having a nice time. We're two men nearly in our, we're in our 40s. I could say in our 40s, but you're not in your Good. 40s yet. At midnight you'll tonight. Never know, you'll never know what it feels like to be... <laughs> I know what I was, Richard. I know yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah, well, I'm saying that there's uh, strange things happen to me, all these silly things, or cartoony things, or whatever you want to call them. But there's a quite a lot of chaos in my life. And um, last night at my 40th birthday party, I paid a tribute to my mum and dad who were there because I thought, well, it's 40 years ago since they had me. And I was talking about them, and it sort of made me realise that the sort of the chaos that surrounds me, I've just got from them, and that they are all over the shop. I mean, they. My my mum the other day was on a train and she was drunk. And she was meant to get off at Newark, and she fell asleep, and she woke up and she was in Chesterfield. And she got off the train, it was too late to get a train back, there were no more trains back. And she was drunk, and so she decided to sleep the night on the platform. <laughs> and then the other day, my mum and dad were walking in Chiswick House and Grounds, and they hadn't noticed the time, and they got locked in, and they had to get rescued <laughs> over the wall by the fire brigade. <laughs> And then not, another time, not long ago, my dad drove to Birmingham Airport and he was, he was late as usual and he, was, he got the, could put his car in the short stay car park. He looked at his watch and it was 55 minutes until the flight took off and he thought, I, can, I reckon I can make this flight. And then he opened the boot of his car and the dog was in there. <laughs> so it's, it's in the jeans, Rich, yeah. you see what I mean? It's in the jeans. My dad would have done that magic number thing if he'd been presenting yeah. it. It's in the jeans. <laughs> in the jeans. 
but it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, nothing, nothing it sticks and everyone still, you know, you, you still work and everyone still likes you. Do you think? I mean, you know, you've been punched in the face in the toilet, but apart from that, everyone <laughs> likes you. Yeah, that's uh, true. That's, uh, that was my, my, my now wife's ex-boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's not everyone likes me, but uh, yeah, it's still working. I think, yeah. um, I think at the moment, I mean, it's... My thirties were a lot of fun, right? I mean, it's I just, they just not over not. yet, Richard. They're not They're over. Yet. Something could go horribly wrong, or <laughs> even better. Yeah, know? yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, but I think I don't know what happens next, really. And I'm I'm not as anxious as I should be about it. But I'm, you know, I'm turning forty. Um, I'm working in America. But I don't know how, if it's going to work out when I start in a couple of weeks. But I don't know where I'm going to be or what's going to happen. Um, but it, it's certainly something new is happening now, and. Probably I should finally learn from my mistakes. <laughs> I think it's time. And I said if I'm going to do sensible stuff over there, there may need to be a new version of me that emerges. Um, I just don't know whether I've got the, the willpower or the capacity to find it. <laughs> well, when I send them the copy of this podcast over and what you said earlier, which I can only apologise for, <laughs> <laughs> you will never work in America again. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, not filmed, is it? It is filmed. So there's a footage of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and to be honest, I'm just going to cut out everything else you said and every answer to every question is just you going to be repeating that over and over again. I'm going to be working for ABC News <laughs> and there's footage of me on yeah. YouTube saying the N-word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, like, who do you blame for all the world's problems, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> A bug shot. <laughs> Don't say it again. That only makes my job much easier. Uh, well, if nothing else, I need to love got another chapter for a future book. <laughs> Richard. It's another incident. Former Blue Peter presenter Richard Bacon strikes yet again. <laughs> yet again. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to have to wind up because I have to now introduce the uh, new act of the year 2015 the competition, which I'm doing now. In here, can hang around if you want to watch it here. Not you at home, it's, it's past. Uh, so uh, come and see the next year's one. Uh, thank you very much to my 100th guest and uh, finally. <laughs> How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>